Greetings, brethren. Welcome to the Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 2014. Now, we're making our way through a number of years, in fact, 10 years, when the Passover does not fall in the middle of the week, does not fall on a Wednesday. After 2000, I think it is 2000, let's see, 10 years. Yeah, right? During 2000, getting into 20, then we have five years out of 10 where the Passover falls in the middle of the week. Now, these things happen because of the variation with the calculations to keep everything in in order and in sequence and on time as God has set the calendar through the calculated Hebrew calendar. When Jesus began to preach the gospel in Galilee, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand and the time has been fulfilled. Repent and believe the gospel. Now the gospel is the whole message of God. That includes the Old Testament and the New Testament. And within that, you have the kingdom of God, then you have the kingdom of the kingdom of God, then you have the gospel of grace, and now there is the gospel of peace. All of these are aspects of the overall gospel of Jesus Christ. So today we are going to cover the gospel of peace and perfection and how that relates to the Feast of Unleavened Bread in our lives. Now, first of all, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace and the King of Peace. However, human beings are at odds with God. And so we start out, because we have carnal minds, we start out against God. That's why here in Romans 8, it tells us about the carnal mind. It says, verse 5, Romans 8, For those who walk according to the flesh mind the things of the flesh. But those who walk according to the Spirit mind the things according to the Spirit. That's what our whole focus of our lives need to be on. The spiritual things of God, the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to give us the love and understanding of God and his word, and to look forward to the kingdom of God and bringing peace to this earth, which we can see really greatly needs that peace. It's just absolutely amazing the things that have been happening. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, and the wages of sin is death. Yes, it is true. As in Adam, we all die. But then when we have the spirit of Christ, then we are to develop the character of God, the love of God, the grace of God, and all of those things in our lives. But to be spiritually minded is life, and peace. So we're going to talk about the peace of God. But here's where we begin. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Now that's an amazing thing. And we see that more and more in the world today. Now, Jesus is called the King of Peace. Let's come back here to Hebrews, the seventh chapter. And Jesus Christ is our high priest right now. And he is the one who leads us in truth. He is the one who leads us in righteousness. And so while we live in the world, as Jesus said, we are not of the world. And during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
we need to concentrate not only on, on getting sin out of our lives, that's one aspect of it, but we need to concentrate on our relationship with God so that we have more yieldedness to God, more love to God, more peace with God. Now, we're going to see that in the world, there are going to be difficulties for us. But anyone who has peace of mind, in spite of all the difficulties going on, that has to come from God. Now, let's pick it up here in verse 1. Hebrews 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, now, wherever you read the Most High God in the Old Testament, that is an inkling of God the Father. And Jesus came to reveal the Father. The Father was never revealed in the Old Testament. Whom Abraham met as he was returning from his slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, on the one hand, being interpreted king of righteousness and on the other hand king of Salem which is king of peace and he's also called the king in our lives everything and for the peace of God all right now this was prophesied to be back in Isaiah the ninth chapter. So let's go back there and see. And it's always been an enigma to the Jews to try and understand this verse. How can God, as we're going here to Isaiah the ninth chapter, how can God become a man, born of the Virgin Mary, and still be God? How is that possible? Well, all things are possible with God according to his plan. Now, one thing is not possible with God. He cannot lie. And he will not compromise against evil. All right, Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a son is given, no, unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And you look and see, in this world today, do we not need the government of God on this earth? Yes, indeed. And the good news is, it is coming. And the good news is that we are being trained for that right now. And the good news is, that we are going to have peace with God now and help him bring peace to this world. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. So here it is, a human being born called the Mighty God. The Everlasting Father, and of course, Jesus will not be an everlasting father until those who come through the millennium be with Christ and the bride and all of the saints ruling. Then he will be an everlasting father. Today we are the children of God the Father. During the millennium they will become the children of Jesus Christ and the perfected church. The Prince of Peace. Now, how do we have peace with God? All right, we'll examine some of that, okay? We have peace with God because we love him and keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We'll see that a little bit later. That's how we have the love of God. All right, now since we're here in Isaiah, let's come to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. 
And the whole thing that is important for us to understand and realize is this, is that we need the love and spirit of God in our lives ever more, especially in what we are, are doing right now. Okay? Now, Isaiah 53 talks about, and it is a prophecy of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And of course, we have observed the Passover and night to be much observed and the first holy day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now then, here's an aspect of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we need to understand. No one can be at peace with God without the sacrifice of Christ and his shed blood and forgiveness. And now remember, God has given us his Holy Spirit. And he has given it so we can develop the mind of Christ, the character of God, and to be at peace with him. However, this had to happen to Christ. Verse 1, For who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And it's revealed to us. The strength of God revealed to us. For he, sh for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root in a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness that we should look upon him. Nor beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now why did Jesus do all of this and go through it so that he can save mankind? Surely he has borne our infirmities and has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him as strict, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Now what does that mean? Well, we just read that the carnal mind is enmity against God. We were enemies with God, cut off from God. And in order to make peace with God, Christ had to die. And that's part of being the Prince of Peace and the King of Peace. Okay? Now that's important for us to know, to realize, and to, to understand that we need peace with God and peace with each other. Now, we'll talk about all these things as we go through this sermon. Now, let's come to Galatians, the fifth chapter. And let's look, examine, again, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Because these things are the important aspects of what we need to concentrate on during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which then we carry over into our daily living. And it is true, we do have to fight against human nature. And we do that, and we will see how that is done as we understand what it means to be perfected. But here, the fruit of the Spirit, notice this. Verse 22, Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Peace with God and peace with one another. Now we will see that peace has to come from God. It's not the kind of peace that we would get in the world. It's not the kind of peace that would come because of the things that we do or the things that we of our own selves and human nature can do. See, because we have to realize that this peace can only come from God. 
it can only come from Christ. It can only come from the righteousness of God. Now, let's see what Paul writes concerning this peace and how it comes through Jesus Christ. Let's come to Ephesians 2, just a page over, and verse 13. Now, let's go back to verse 12. Ephesians 2 and verse 12. Now that you were without Christ at that time, and we were all without Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And look at what it is in the world without God. All the things that are going on, just as Jesus said, would happen. But now in Christ, only through him you who were once far off are made near by the blood of Christ and that ties right in with Isaiah 53 for he is our peace who has made us both one peace with God peace toward God peace with the brethren within the church. And you can see all the problems and difficulties that have happened within the church because too much carnality came about. Too much carnality was allowed, fighting and warring and all of the things of the flesh. And so God has had to separate the churches. And the, the separation is still going on until we all come to the point that we love God and have peace with God and peace with one another. Now let's continue on right here. That he might reconcile both to God, Jews and Gentiles, in one body through the cross, having slain the enmity by it. Now that's, there are two things of enmity. The enmity against God and the enmity toward Jews and Gentiles, or toward people in general. Now notice, verse 17, Now when he came, he preached the gospel, Peace to you who were far off, and to those who were near. Now notice how this peace is established. And that is through the Spirit of God. Now notice. For through him, that is Christ, we both have direct access by one Spirit to the Father. And that's how peace is made. Now let's also understand. And because of this, we have great hope. Now let's read on and see how God is working this out and that it's through his spirit and through his righteousness and that we can change and grow and overcome and become peaceful with God, peaceful with each other, and as we will see, be perfected in Christ. That's the whole purpose of it. Now notice, so then you are no longer aliens and foreigners, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of the household of God and are being built up on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the building, all the building. God is building and working in you as we have seen. He is building, working, developing. And that's why we need to be at peace with God and peace with each other. In the world, we're going to see we're going to have a little difficulty. Okay. Being built up, okay, and whom the building 
being conjointly fitted together is increasing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Now that's a tremendous thing, brethren. Now notice, notice how this is really an important factor in what we're doing. Let's come back here to the Gospel of John. Let's come back to John 14, and let's see what Jesus told the disciples. John 14, now the peace we have with God does not necessarily mean that we have peace with everybody in the world. We are to have peace with God and have peace with each other. Here, John 14, let's pick it up in verse... Let's pick it up here in verse 25. Let's see how the Holy Spirit is connected with this. Because there can never be any peace with God if we are living in sin. It just won't happen. Now let's pick it up here in verse 25. Verse 25. I have spoken these things to you while I am present with you. But when the Comforter comes, even the Holy Spirit, which the Father will send in my name, that one shall teach you all things, because we're led by the Holy Spirit. We read and study the Bible. It is a spiritual process for us, because we learn, we are convicted, we change, we're inspired, we're able through the Word of God to grow and overcome. Okay? And shall bring to your remembrance everything that I have told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. So this peace is a spiritual peace that comes from God. It is not a truce. It is a complete change. And God the Father gives us that peace. It comes from Christ. My peace. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it fear. And that's how we need to lead our lives. Now, we're going to talk a lot about the things that are taking place in the world as we're going along. And... The world is not going to improve very much. In fact, it's going to get worse. So we need to have the peace of mind from God the Father and Jesus Christ. Let's come over here to chapter 16 and verse 32. Just turn the page. Jesus said, listen, the time is coming and has already come that you shall be scattered each to his own and you shall leave me alone, yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Remember the song that you heard some time ago? Alone, yet not alone. Even though we are alone, if we have God the Father in Christ in us, we are not alone. And God is with us and working with us and helping us and changing us. Okay? Verse 33, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. Now it's a very interesting statement there, may have. And that means there are things that God does for us and there are things that we need to do so that that peace may be perfected. that you may have peace in the world you shall have tribulation but be courageous I have overcome the world so you see that shows us in order to change and grow and overcome it has to be through Christ 
And when we do, we will have peace of mind. We can understand the things that are happening that are going on. We can realize all the grief and anguish that's going to be in the world and the things there. But regardless of the outside circumstances, if we have peace with God and Jesus Christ and peace of mind, now that means our part in having that peace of mind is through the power of the Holy Spirit to grow and change and overcome and not get emotionally involved in the things in the world and to realize even though there are difficulties and problems that we are going to face and the circumstances that we are going to come across in our lives are going to be difficult indeed. Jesus said you will have tribulation but with the peace of mind of God we can face all of it. We can handle all of it. So the key thing we need to do is not let our emotions get carried away when there are difficulties. Now that's hard to do but that's all part of the peace of God. But nevertheless, we can do that. Let's come to 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter, and let's see something very important as to how Paul said we can do this. 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter. Now before we go to chapter 3, let's come back over here to chapter 2 for just a minute, and let's see how Paul brings this out for us in such a clear way. Verse 13, 2 Thessalonians 2. Verse 13, 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we are duty-bound to give thanks to God always concerning you, brethren, who are beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning has called you unto salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, and belief of the truth. Sanctification means set aside, made holy by the Spirit of God, unto which you were called by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold fast the ordinances that we, correction, that you were taught whether by word or by our epistle. Now notice what he says here in the next two verses because this is important. This is the fruit of the peace of God. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal encouragement and good hope through grace, encourage your hearts, that is within, not to have anguish within and put on a facade of that everything is okay, but to have peace within and then be able to overcome the things that are without. Encourage your hearts and establish you in every good word and work to accomplish the will of God. Now, chapter 3 and verse 16. Verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. So that's something that we need to really pray about then whatever it is in your life, don't worry, don't fret, don't stew, have the peace of God. And with that, and with the Spirit of God, ask God to help you have the control of mind and emotion so that you are at peace with God and as we'll see, at peace with everyone that you can be as far as you are concerned. Okay, 
Now let's come back. Now let's come to the epistle of Romans, Romans 15, and let's see what Paul writes for us to encourage us, to help us, to point us toward that peace with God. Peace with God, it comes from God. That's why if you are overcoming sin or you're being tempted and you're torn, what you need to do is really pray and ask God to give you peace of mind and obey and serve God. That's what's important. Now, let's come over here to verse 4. Romans 15 and verse 4. For all things that were written before were written for our instruction so that we through patient endurance and encouragement of the scriptures may have hope and also we will see peace. Verse 5. Now may the God of patience and encouragement grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord and one mouth you may glorify God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says here, therefore receive one another according as Christ is also received us to the glory of God. Now, let's come down here to verse 10. Again it says, Rejoice, all you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and praise all you people. And again Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that arises shall rule the Gentiles. In him shall all the Gentiles hope. Now then, notice verse 13. Notice all these words of encouragement that we need so that we can have a, a proper relationship with God in peace. Verse 13, may the God of hope fill you now with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. So the more you believe in Christ, the more hope you have, the more peace you have, the more your life dedicated to God is going to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. May abound in hope and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what God wants us to have, to be led of the Holy Spirit. Now back here in Romans the 12th chapter, he also gives us an admonition showing that we have to put forth the effort. Okay? Romans the 12th chapter and let's pick it up here in verse Romans 12 and verse 18. If possible. Now there are going to be times when it's not possible. As much as is your part, be at peace with all men. Now that's counterbalanced by what Jesus said, that in him we will have peace, but in the world will have tribulation. So we have to balance that out, and especially with those of us together in the church. All of us have gone through so much turmoil and difficulty and have not had peace the way that we need it. So now is the time that we can begin concentrating on that can begin having the peace that we need among each other, and that comes from the love of God. And when all of these things are put together, then we find out that we can be led in perfection. Now let's come to Ephesians, the first chapter. Ephesians 1 and verse 1. And let's look and see how Paul, in nearly every one of his epistles that he writes, brings out this kind of introduction. And this is re really very meaningful to us because, you see, we need to understand, which we do, that all of these things come from God with his Spirit. Verse 1, Paul, 
an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because that is a projection clear out in time, whoever the faithful are. Now verse 2, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about that. Every epistle starts out grace and peace. And we need the peace of God, which passes all understanding to rule in our lives. Now notice how we have this peace and continue to maintain it right here is by keeping our minds and our hearts on the goal and on our calling and what God has done for us. And this is what we need to do, brethren. Let's understand the great significance of our calling. And let's understand why God has brought us through all of these things because he loves us, he cares for us, and he wants us to be at peace with him. Now notice, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly things with Christ. Now, to have the fruits of the Holy Spirit, those are heavenly things. To grow and develop in those things, those are heavenly things. Not carnal things, not physical things, but coming from God. Now notice verse 4. Always remember this in case you get discouraged. According as he has personally chosen us. The called, chosen, and faithful. Now think about that. And he's done it not because of who we are. But he has done it because he loves us. And because we answered the call. Many are called, few are chosen, because few answer the call. And we have answered the call. He has personally chosen us, and when we answer the call, that's what he does. Now notice, for himself, Before the foundation of the world, that is, he had this plan before the foundation of the world that he would choose those who would respond to his calling in order that we might be holy and blameless before him in love. That can only come through the peace of God. Having predestinated us for sonship to himself, notice, himself, God himself, through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us objects of his grace in the beloved Son. Now that is fantastic for us to know and understand, brethren. And having peace becomes a mindset. And that mindset comes from Christ. That mindset comes from the Father. Come over here to Philippians, the fourth chapter, and let's read in verse 4. Philippians 4 and verse 4. Rejoice always in the Lord, even in times of difficulty and trouble because those times in difficulty and trouble can be overcome. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. And isn't that what Jesus said? Back in Matthew, the sixth chapter, don't be anxious. Don't have turmoil in your minds about anything, but by prayer you take it to God. 
You pray about it. You ask for guidance. You ask for deliverance. You ask for understanding. And you keep at it until the answer comes. And supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God in everything. Now notice what happens when we do that. Just like we have, have covered and just like you know, when you study the word of God, God is talking to you. When you are praying to God, you are talking to him. And since you have his spirit within you, he is there. He hears. And the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us, communicating to God the deepest, innermost part of our being so that we can have peace. Verse 7, And the peace of God which passes all understanding, all human understanding, shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Now think about that. That gives us strength. That gives us character. And that helps to guard our hearts and our minds against all the strife and difficulty in the world. Yes, it's horrible to see the things going on in the world. Yes, there are going to be a lot of people affected and die and suffer. But with the peace of God within us, then we can endure to the end, as Jesus has said. Then we can truly overcome and accomplish what God wants us to do. So remember, this is the gospel of peace. And it is to those who have the Spirit of God. So I hope this really helps you during this Feast of Unleavened Bread in understanding what we need to do and how we need to overcome. So let's take a break and we'll come back and look at how God is perfecting us. God wants to perfect us in his image, in his character, in his person. And we have our part in developing that perfection through using the Holy Spirit of God within us. And we know that the final perfection will come at the resurrection. Let's begin here first in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And while we're turning there, let's understand that Jesus said, right in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 48, become perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. What did he state there with that? He stated the whole goal of the gospel, the whole goal of his coming to this earth. Now, let's see some of the things that we need to understand, okay? Now, let's pick it up here in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. So we can see where we start from because we are imperfect and it's really quite a thing when we understand it okay that Jesus Christ himself was perfected that though he were a son he learned from the things that he suffered hold your place here in 2 Corinthians and let's read that in Hebrews Let's come here to Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Let's see that Jesus himself, as God in the flesh, was perfected. Why? 
so that he could fully understand the whole human perspective. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse 7, who in the days of his flesh offered up both prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because he feared God. Now notice that this had a profound effect upon God himself. That's why God has given all judgment to Jesus Christ. Now let's see it right here in Hebrews 7, continuing on now, verse 8. Although he were a son, yet learned he obedience from the things which he suffered, and having been perfected. Now, he set the way. He is the forerunner. He set the example. Okay. He became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Quite a thing, isn't it? Even Jesus Christ himself was perfected. Now let's come back here to 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, and let's see what we need to do and then how it is that we begin and what we need to strive for. 2 Corinthians 6, and let's pick it up here in verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and lawlessness have in common? See, you can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. You have to be holy with God. Because to have one foot in the church and one foot in the world, you're really not developing the kind of relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ that you need to do in order to be perfected. All right? Now let's read on here, because he says, For what fellowship does light have with darkness? And what union does Christ have with Belial? Or what part does a believer have with an unbeliever? And what agreement does, is there between a temple of God and idols? Now think of that. For you are a temple of the living God. So what idols are we talking about? Not just the things in the world, but as we covered earlier, the idols in the mind. You are a temple of the living God because God the Father and Jesus Christ have made their dwelling place with you. Exactly as God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, understand how tremendous that that is. You know, in the letter that I wrote concerning the Holy Spirit of God within us, I think that was in a December letter. That is a letter that that is designed to help you understand how you can grow and how you can overcome and how you can love God even more. They're dwelling in us. There can be no greater thing in this life. And Christ and the Father want to perfect us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we will see how that is done. And that's why we have the un days of unleavened bread. To put the leaven or sin out of our life, that's half of it. The other half is to put in the unleavenedness of God. All right? Verse 17, Therefore come out from the midst of them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean, and I will receive you. And I shall be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Those are tremendous words, brethren. Now notice, 
what our response needs to be. Verse 1, Now then, beloved, since we have these promises, we should purge ourselves from every defilement of the flesh and spirit. And that means overcoming the idols and sins within. Notice, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, in perfecting holiness, that means that you are perfected day by day. That comes with prayer. That comes with study. That comes with overcoming. That comes with recognizing the sin within. And we will see how all of this comes together. Let's understand. Let's come back here to Psalm 19. Because Psalm 19 is very important when we combine that with Hebrews 10, 16, that God is writing and inscribing in our hearts and in our minds his laws and his commandments, okay? Psalm 19, let's come there because this talks about the laws of God and what it does. Now, as we're turning there, let's understand something. A very important function of the Holy Spirit of God, which is the spirit of the truth, is to reveal to us in our minds the sins we need to overcome and expose those thoughts that are not right so we can be perfected in holiness. Now let's come down here to verse 7. And it's accomplished with God's perfection Christ's perfection and the Holy Spirit and the laws and commandments of God. And then this is how then we can love God with all our heart and mind and soul and being. That's what it is. Now let's pick it up here in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. It restores your thinking, it restores your health, and it restores your perspective and grants you the love of God. The testimony of the Lord is, is sure, making wise the simple. Now that means the uneducated in the way of God. You grow in wisdom, you grow in righteousness, you grow in truth, and all of these things are what we might call the building blocks of perfection that God is doing within us. Now, we realize, and always keep in mind, that the final perfection is the resurrection. And that's going to be an awesome thing indeed. Now, verse 8. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes, giving understanding, giving truth, giving strength of mind, strength of thought. Now that's why we have the Proverbs for the youth, having the program where you can go through one chapter of Proverbs a day for a month. And if a month is less than 31 days, then you double up on some of the shorter ones. Now then, after the month is over, you go back and start again. And you go back and start again. This way, it's helping to train the mind. They call it, in the world, programming. And God wants to train our minds and to program us with his spirit. Now that's quite a thing indeed when we understand. Now verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments are of the Lord are true and righteous all together. More to be desired than gold. Yea, then much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Isn't that a great thing to understand? 
What we have with the word of God. What we have with the spirit of God. The truth of God. The love of God. Is greater than the greatest riches of the world. None of these things. You, you look at gold. Every one of the pharaohs, and they're still dead because their bodies are still here. <laughs> to show their wealth and immortality, supposedly, they covered their coffins with gold. But it didn't do them one bit of good and neither can all the gold in the world verse 11 moreover here's what happens when they're written in your mind you have them in your heart you're loving God he's bringing you to perfection he wants you to overcome he wants you to get rid of the sins and the idols within moreover you're by them, by them, through the laws of God, the commandments of God, the precepts of God, every aspect of the word of God, coupled with the spirit of God, and the Father and Christ dwelling in us. Look at how many things we have going for us to be unleavened in Christ. Moreover, by them, your servant is warned uh oh don't do that in keeping them there is great reward and remember this Jesus said blessed is the one who keeps my works unto the end and that means this when we walk in the commandments of God love him keep his commandments those are spiritual works not works of some ritual not works of doing something but works of building the character of God within you to perfection and God is the one who is doing it you see but there is a great reward in it now, why does God work this way? Verse 12, who can understand his errors? Because we all justify ourselves, don't we? Oh, we don't want to admit that we're wrong, do we? So he says, oh, cleanse me from my secret faults. That's within. See, that's how the perfect law of God works with us. Okay? Notice what it does. Notice what God will do. Verse 13, And keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins, impetuous things that you do. Oh, I never thought about that. Oh, why didn't I think about that? And after you do it, you say, Why did I do that? And we've all said that. We all say that, don't we? Yes. Because you see, now we are imperfect but we are on the road to perfection. All right? Do not let them rule over me. And that's what Paul said in Romans 6. Because you are under grace, sin shall not rule over you. Doesn't say you won't sin, but you can repent and get rid of it, you see. He says, then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent from great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Quite a powerful understanding of how God perfects us through his laws and commandments. Now then, stop and think about this. How can Protestantism or Catholicism have anything to do with God's way when they do away with the laws of God? Not just 
on the outside. But God wants them to have them written here. That is how we govern and control our lives. So we need to keep that in mind. Now let's come to Psalm 138. Now this is a tremendous psalm to also show us how we overcome and how we are perfected. Verse 1. I will praise you with my whole heart before the gods. Think of that. Wholehearted. That's what it brings to us. That's how God wants us to be perfected. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness. And that's what we do every day. Because when we get down on our knees and pray, we're praying directly to the temple of God in heaven above. And we have direct connection with the Holy Spirit of God. And for your your loving kindness, and for your truth. And every word of God is true. And God is true. And righteous and holy. And loving and kind and good. For you have magnified above all your name and your word. Because the word of God is he speaking to us. And isn't it wonderful that we have it written down so that we can all hear what God wants us to know by reading his word. Let's go forward with it. Okay. Verse 3. In the day when I cried, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Now this has to do with the coming millennial reign of Christ and the saints together. Though the Lord is high, yet he has respect to the lowly. But the haughty he knows far off, they're way out there. See, look at it this way. We are in the bosom of the Father because of Jesus Christ. Notice, this ties right in with what Jesus said. We will have peace with him, but trouble in the world. But notice when we have trouble in the world. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you, God, will revive me. You shall stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand shall save me. And as we're going to learn on the last day of unleavened bread, God fights our battles for us. That's what's important to understand. Verse 8, the Lord will perfect his work in me. Think on that. Apply that to yourself. The Lord will perfect his work in me. And didn't we read where we are the workmanship of the Father created unto good works that we should walk in them? Yes, indeed. Your steadfast love, O God, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. And isn't that interesting? We are the work of the hands of God, physically created and spiritually being created, being renewed and being perfected. So that's quite a thing that we really need to understand and look forward to. Now let's come to Colossians, the first chapter, and let's see how Paul framed all of this in relationship to the gospel and what he was writing and having to do with our lives and what Christ is going to do and with God in us and Christ in us. Now, Colossians 1, 
And let's pick it up here in verse 25. No, let's go back to verse 24. Now, even this, this gives us the ability and the strength and the truth to do what God wants us to do. Verse 24, Now I am rejoicing in my sufferings for you, and I am filling up in my flesh that which is behind of the tribulations of Christ, for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a servant, according to the administration of God that was given to me for you in order to complete the word of God, that is, finish writing the word of God. Even the mystery that has been hidden from ages and from generations, but has now been revealed to his saints, to whom God did will to make known. Now think on that for a minute. You are here, I am here, all of us who are gods, by his will, as we read in Ephesians, the first chapter in the last segment, that he has predetermined that we are going to be his sons and daughters. Did will to make known what is the riches of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, not a religion out here that's outside. That's why God hates religion, but a conversion within. The power of God's Spirit within. God the Father and Jesus Christ dwelling in us. And as it says there in First, Second Corinthians, the sixth chapter, that I will dwell in them and walk in them. Think on that. Verse 28, whom we preach, admonishing every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That is the goal. Now we know that there are things that we have to work on to change, to grow, and overcome. Without a doubt, that is true. And we'll see how we need to do that. Now notice, for which cause I also labor, striving, he's striving according to his inner working, which works in me with power. And that's how it needs to be with us. We do our part, but it is Christ in us doing the work, working, the inner working of it, see. That's what's so important. All right. Now let's see what we need to do here and how we need to handle this. Okay, let's, before we go there, come to uh, Colossians 4 and verse 12. Now this is talking about Epaphras, who is a servant of Christ. Verse 12, Epaphras, a servant of Christ who is among you, salutes you. He is always striving for you in his prayers. Now notice how God is working with us with the things that we do. See? That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And of course, that will come with the resurrection. All right, now let's come to 2 Thessalonians, the 10th chapter. 2 Thessalonians, the 10th chapter. Because this tells us how we use the Spirit of God within, how we use the commandments of God written within, how we have that relationship with God, and what do we do after we get up from our prayers or get up from our study and go about our daily lives. Okay? We still are warring against the flesh, and we are still being perfected. And here is how we have got to do it. Verse 3. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Because, see, it is a spiritual warfare. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty through God to the overthrowing of strongholds. Now where do those strongholds lie? Right here. Our thoughts. The things that come into our minds. The things that come in because of the world we live in and see and watch. Okay? The things that we have in our mind. That's why we are not to have, as it talks there in Second or Ephesians, the fourth chapter. That's why we are not to have any bitterness, not to have any anger. If we're angry, we get over it and we move on. Okay? Now here's what we do. Here is the stronghold. Casting down vain imaginations and every high thing that is sin in your mind that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. Now, that is the work of the Spirit within us to bring those into captivity to grab hold of them, repent of them, ask God, God to clean us, washing of the water of the word, to cleanse us, to purify us from all of these things. And that is a day by day by day by day operation that we have to do. No doubt about it. Let's repeat that again and bringing into captivity you control and you expel just as our minds have been made to remember our minds can also reject and forget and get rid of and especially with the power of the spirit of god within us every thought into the obedience of Christ. That is a full-time operation, is it not? Yes, indeed. And having a readiness to avenge all disobedience whenever your obedience has been fulfilled. Now that shows the operation of what we need to do. Now, let's look at another aspect of overcoming and perfection. Now, let's come to Philippians, the third chapter. Philippians, the third chapter. Let's see how Paul was overcoming every day. He was fighting against these things. Every Christian who has ever been has been fighting against these things. All right? Philippians, the third chapter. Philippians 3, let's pick it up beginning in verse 7. So we can see the whole process of overcoming, changing, growing, controlling our minds, being perfected, developing the love of God, etc. And all of this ties right back with the first segment that I did, the peace of God. Verse 7, Yet all things that were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. But then truly, I count all things to be lost for the excellency of of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but dung that I may win Christ. Very important for us to understand. And of course, the finality of that will be the resurrection. Verse 9, that I may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is derived from law, but the righteousness which is by the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God that is based, based on faith. That I may know him and the power of, the res, of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now notice how Paul yearned for this with everything that there is. All his being, all his might. We need to do the same thing. Notice. 
Verse 11 again, if by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now notice this. His thought process at that time, which needs to be our thought process at this time, not as though I have already received or have already been perfected, but I am striving in the spiritual battle so that I may also lay hold on that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. See, the thing that is important is this next verse. Even if there has been backsliding, even if you have not been fighting the battle the way that you should, you can now. There is always repentance. And remember this, as long as there is life, there is hope. As long as there is hope, there is repentance. And God will not reject you. Notice, verse 12. Not as though I had already received or been perfected, but I am striving, so that I may also lay hold on that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not count myself as having attained, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind. How? By bringing every thought into captivity to Christ by the washing of the water of the word and reaching forth to the things that are ahead. Remember the goal. That's the whole purpose of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We are to become sinless. And that sinlessness is through Christ. And the ultimate of it is the salvation and resurrection. Now notice what he does. This is what we need to do. He says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Always reaching forth. Always forgetting the things that are behind. Don't let them grab a hold of your mind and keep you from overcoming and changing. And keep you from the peace of God and the perfection of God. Now notice what he says here, verse 15. Because we can attain a certain level of perfection before the resurrection. So then, let as many as be perfect be of this mind. And if in anything you are otherwise minded, God will reveal even this to you so that you can repent and overcome, so that you can get it out of your mind. Let the sweeping of the word of God cleanse it with the spirit of God and replace that with the holiness of Christ. Verse 16, Nevertheless, in regard to that which we have attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. That is what God wants us to do. The perfection that comes from God. Okay? That's what the plan that God has for us. That's what he has laid out for us. This is a magnificent thing, brethren, so that we can accomplish all of what God wants us to do. Yes, if we remember, it is the peace of God and the perfection of God. And that perfection comes with our working with the Spirit of God within us as God the Father and Christ are dwelling in us so that we can bring every thought into captivity to God. Break down every idol that is in the mind. Overcome every sin and temptation that comes along. And that's how then we are completely unleavened in Christ and the power of of his perfection.